Hello everyone. This time around, I want to talk about the notion of subscription-based software licensing. Now, personally, I think the notion of software licensing is stupid anyway. Uh, it's an outgrowth of the broken intellectual property nonsense that we have in, in the Western world, at least today. That's another topic, though. It's a big topic all on its own, and I don't really want to talk about that today. Let's just take as read that software licensing makes sense for, the, for this discussion. Now, what doesn't make sense is that software that doesn't inherently need to connect with some remote service, so for instance, uh, something that would need to uh, connect uh, with a remote service would be a software designed to interact with, say, a library catalog or uh, a point of sale uh, system for a large organization or something like that. That would have an inherent need to talk to some remote service or potentially would stuff that doesn't have that need is anything like your word processor on your computer uh, or you, you, you know that sort of thing or your email software for instance doesn't have an inherent dependency on any particular remote service so software like that has no need for a subscription-based uh, model. It's software that's, software that's used standalone, definitely has no need for a subscription-based model, and software that uh, doesn't get updated regularly definitely doesn't need a subscription-based model. Now, why would a subscription model make sense? Well, if you have software that has to be kept up to date uh, and needs regular updates to be useful, then a subscription would probably make sense as an option at least. Such things where that would make sense would be uh, tax preparation software, for instance, because the tax rules are continually changing. Uh, payroll software, you know, things like that, definitely it can make sense. There are updates that need to be incorporated regularly. So in that case, a subscription makes sense so that you get the updates. But if you don't get the updates and you don't need the parts that are changing, then you're fine, right? So the software should continue working even if you don't have the latest updates. As a matter of fact, the software itself should have no way of knowing whether you've got the latest updates or not. That should be separate to the software. Now, something else where a subscription model makes sense is, say, a, da a remote database or something like that that you ha have access to. But in that case, you're not paying, or you shouldn't be paying for the software to access it. You should be paying for the access to the service being provided. So, and this would be something like, is similar to email service, for instance, from your hosting company. You can use any email software you want that, that speaks the appropriate protocols to access the mailbox. You don't need to use the email provider's software, uh, as long as they support the standard protocols. Now, in this world where Gmail and company have become a the thing, and uh, you know everybody's accessing their stuff through webmail interfaces, uh, people have lost track of this. And the whole notion of software as a service has come about uh, to lock people into these subscription models for software that doesn't inherently require remote services. So now you've got things like um, like office software, like word processors, spreadsheets, and that sort of thing, running in your web browser uh, off of, uh, say, Google servers. And that you have to have access to, to use. And there they can charge subscription services because now they've locked you into their software, which has to be on their uh, their platform and that uh, and that's where why this big push by these cloud companies 
is happening. It's to get people to use everything in the cloud so that they can extract money from everybody for things on an ongoing, continual basis for things that don't need to be done that way. Now, there are cases where this type of setup is useful and it does make sense. Uh, but it, uh, it doesn't make sense for the average consumer, even the average small business. Uh, word processing, for instance, that does not ever need to be an online software as a service thing. It doesn't need to be in the cloud. You can store your file in the cloud if you need to share it but the word processing software itself doesn't need to be. Uh, and if you use a reasonably standard document format, and by the way, the Microsoft formats are not such, uh, if you use something appropriately standardized, then people should be able to open your files, even if they don't happen to have exactly the same software. The reason Microsoft's formats don't count is even Microsoft software doesn't treat the stuff consistently. So the whole notion that software should always be licensed on, on a subscription basis is stupid. Now what brought this up is I was uh, tooling around, you know, looking at things on the, the interwebs, and I ran across a video where someone was talking about the, a change in the uh, pricing model for um, I think it, I can't remember what it was, I think it was CAD software of some kind, and that they had changed it from uh, where you could, uh, you, you know, purchase a license, and that license would be essentially perpetual. Uh, once you purchased it, you had that license, and it wouldn't expire. Uh, but, of course, you wouldn't get the new version of the software unless you paid for that. And that made sense because CAD work is not done online and shouldn't be. It's too detailed, too complicated. And you need to save your, your design stuff. And changes in the CAD software can change semantics of things and end up causing your carefully crafted design to fail when you actually go to use it if you import that design into a different version of the software. Maybe it was some aspect of its layout engine or something like that uh, allowed it to work properly and that an improvement or a change in the layout engine causes something to be routed differently and it screws up timing somewhere, any number of things like that. So if you want to get exactly the same result you had before, you pretty much need the same version of the software. And because CAD stuff is an offline process, or should be, then it's relatively safe to call up that, off, that, that version of the software. You know, you can image the whole machine it was on, store that in a backup, bring that up in a virtual machine or something, and you can get exactly what you had before. And apparently this was a, a, a common uh, use method uh, for this software. Now, not saying that's necessarily the smart way to do things, but if you need to make an adjustment to an old design, it is often more efficient just to use the old version of the software. But the purveyors of this software have changed it to a subscription-based model that requires online, requires internet access on a regular basis to verify the license. Yeah, yeah, this is for software that doesn't need, doesn't inherently need to access any remote service to operate. And this, of course, uh, created an uproar among the customer base. Uh, now, this isn't the only type of situation where that comes up, but it's a, a telling one. Now, this is the sort of thing that you see also with things like... Um, uh, game design and so on, where they're using it not as a, a means of extracting money indefinitely, uh, uh, but instead they're requiring that you uh, have online access to verify your license for a particular game or something like that before you can play it. And this is, this is where services like Steam have come up 
And uh, quite frankly, uh, while I do have a couple of Steam games, I think it's a stupid service. And, uh, uh, you know, requiring Steam, a Steam account, just to play the game is dumb. Supporting Steam... And not necessarily stupid, but requiring the entire Steam runtime and everything like that to be operating just to play the game is. Even though Steam does have an offline mode, it does require some really stupid things to enable it. Uh, now, uh, most of the Steam games that, uh, that I've encountered, they don't have an, uh, a regular subscription fee. Once you buy the game, you have the game, as long as you maintain your Steam account. But if Steam ever goes bankrupt or you, uh, or you lose access to Steam, you, you can't go offline if you're already, unless you can get online. You can't go into offline mode. You know, it's, there's a whole bunch of things like that. Now... Uh, you know, but if Steam ever goes away or goes bad or or what have you, or a publisher yanks a game or something like that, then now you no longer have the thing you paid for, and that's kind of bad. Now the whole reason publishers are doing this with games is because they're terrified of piracy. Uh, which is a bad term for it anyway. Uh, you know, it's not really technically theft either uh, when you really look at the proper definition of the term. But uh, when you really get down to it, they're trying to prevent people from playing the game if they haven't bought it. Okay, fine. But if you prevent the people that are playing the game without paying for it from playing the game, you're not going to get any more sales. And that the numbers pretty much bear that out. Uh, you might get a vanishingly small number of additional sales, uh, but you're not going to get a huge number. Uh, so this kind of thing to uh, control uh, access to something like entertainment, uh, it doesn't work. And uh, we're seeing that. People are working around it. The people who don't want to pay for the game or can't pay for it, they're going to work around it. So, uh, you know, so you've got that. Now, of course, there are games that do inherently need some sort of a subscription to be viable. Uh, you know, um, online multiplayer games or something like that where somebody maintains a world. Uh, you, you know, World of Warcraft, whatever. Uh, those, it does make sense to require some sort of a subscription uh, to the actual game world. Uh, it, just because it costs money to maintain the game world. Uh, and in that case, this, you know, a subscription does kind of make sense. Uh, so I'm not arguing totally against subscription-based licensing, but in this case, you're not licensing the game. You're paying for access to the game world, and the game software is what gives you that access. So you can have the game software all you want, but if you don't have access to the world, it's useless. That's fine because it's software to access that game world and you're paying for access to the game world. Uh, so in that case, it makes sense, but it shouldn't be couched as a license fee or subscription fee for the software. It should be a subscription fee to access the game. You're not buying the game, you're paying for access to the game world. So uh, the whole notion of licensing software, uh, you know, for a limited time, that's really what software, uh, like subscription-based licensing is, is about, right? Uh, that you get a license that's good for a period of time and you have to buy a new one uh, or, you know, renew it. Uh, okay, that does kind of make some sense for software that needs regular updates tax software, for instance. But it doesn't make any sense for standalone software that'll work perfectly fine 10 years after you, you acquire it, even if you never get a new version of it. I have software on my uh, system that uh, uh, some of the, the programs on my, my computer, my Linux box, uh, 
they're years and years old, and oftentimes uh, the actual software itself, the source code that is built from, is even older. I know for a long time uh, uh, there was uh, one really common bit of software that hadn't had an update in 15 or 20 years. And that same software, that same source code, was still being used in new systems. And that's because people hadn't found any reason to update the source code. It was still functional. And that's the thing. Now, this particular software is free software, <clears throat> which exploits the uh, copyright system the same way software licensing does, but it exploits it in a way that lets people use the software indefinitely. So, uh, for free, as long as they comply with a couple of relatively easy to comply with rules for end users. Now, in that case, I could always just go and get the new version anytime. But for the, the way things are going with proprietary software, and that's software sold by companies, is that instead of uh, selling you a version of the software that works and uh, then releasing patches when uh, there's something show-stopping they find. Uh, instead of doing that, they're releasing the software to you and they're selling you a limited term license to use it on a limited number of machines. Uh, now, uh, maybe it's reasonable to require the, uh, to pay for based on the number of machines you use it on uh, i'm not convinced that it that that's the best way to do it but again they do need to have some compensation for the real resources they use to make the software so maybe it's not so bad but the notion like uh, say it's a bit of software that doesn't need to be changed that doesn't doesn't need updates to continue functioning uh, okay, fine. The software seller, uh, obviously, if they sell you the software and then you never buy a new one, eventually they're going to go out of business if that's the standard model that their customers use. So they would have to uh, convince people to buy new versions of the software uh, to continue their revenue stream or innovate with new different software packages and and that obviously is not a long-term sustainable business model um, if, if for most types of software and that's why the subscription the limited time subscription model is being pushed so hard for a lot of software even where it doesn't make sense and and that um, so I can see where it's coming from but it, again if it's software that doesn't need continual maintenance, continual updates, people aren't going to see why they need to, to have that uh, regular uh, subscription. Now, something that would be a better way of doing that is, uh, say, support contracts, where uh, people pay you, as you're the uh, software purveyor, they pay you to provide assistance with the software, uh, installing, managing, or whatever. That can be a perfectly reasonable revenue stream. It depends on the type of software, whether that makes sense or not, but it does often make sense. Uh, so if you have software like that, it makes sense to go with the support contract idea rather than turning your software into a, a regular recurring license fee. Now, it looks great to the bean counters to turn software into a continual rev revenue stream. So I can see why a lot of companies go that way, especially since support contracts are harder to sell. But the large companies that, or, or even the small ones with no expertise, that, um, that might need assurances that if they have a problem they can call someone and get help that is probably the the real bread and butter there because that's the same enterprises that would 
be uh, acquiring larger volume licenses for multiple workstations as well. So, they're, and they're more likely to have issues that need solving. Now, not all software falls into that type of category. Say, for instance, word processors, which are pretty well uh, developed by now. If you take a look at LibreOffice, for instance, which is a free word processing package, you can get what you need to write letters and run spreadsheets and, and that sort of thing for free. Uh, and it's supported by people who, uh, who want to support the software. But even if LibreOffice didn't get another software update for the next 20 years, it would probably still be perfectly functional on any platform where someone cared to uh, fix any build issues and put it out there. And, and that's, that's the type of software where it doesn't make sense to have a commercial entity behind it. And that's also the type of software where it's really hard to convince me, at least, that a subscription-based uh, model makes any sense. And, and this is also often the same class of software where it's really hard to convince me that running it in the cloud makes any sense. Uh, but running it in the cloud is about the only way you can really make a subscription model make sense. And at least running it in the cloud does give some potential additional benefits, which you don't get for a word processor running on your machine. So, uh, I guess I, wh where I'm go my whole point really is that subscription-based software licensing kind of makes sense if you squint at it right, but really the thing that should be licensed is not the software. Uh, the thing that you should be paying your regular fee for is whatever remote service you need to access with the software, or for a regular stream of updates. So you're subscribing either to updated versions of the software or you're subscribing to some backend service that the software is used to access. In that case, the subscription fee makes sense, but it shouldn't be a software license fee. In other cases, Software license fees, subscription-based ones, don't make any sense. Really, when you think it through. The whole reason that they're there is either to control piracy, a misguided means of doing that, or as a means to monetize software that doesn't have any inherent monetization value. Uh, and that type of software is the, a clear winner for uh, either um, being some sort of secondary product that a, a company happens to support because it's useful and they get a little bit of revenue from it on the side, or it, it's a good candidate for the free software world, depending on what kind of software it is uh, and that sort of thing. Or it, it, you know, it might just be a case where you need, just need to charge more up front for it. Whatever the uh, situation is. But really what it comes down to is subscription-based licensing for software doesn't really make sense. And I don't think it's ultimately going to survive the test of time. Something else is going to come about and it's going to look a little bit different. And it's not actually going to be software licensing. It's going to be some other mechanism to extract money from consumers. And the other subscription-based thing that you see quite regularly, which often looks like the same thing as a license fee, games, is just a means to uh, extract money from the gamers. Uh, when it, There's really no point, and even if it's not a uh, subscription fee for the, for the game itself, the game software itself, it's a means to keep you from playing the game if you haven't paid for it in the first place. Basically, you're making things more complicated for the uh, paying customers to punish the people that aren't using that version of your, your software anyway, that are using the cracked version, and they're not going to get punished anyway. So, 
either you're going to end up eventually driving your customers to uh, crack your software so they don't need a license, or you're going to end up alienating your customers, especially if you do the licensing wrong. Anyway, uh, that's probably enough rambling about that for now, so I'm going to leave off here. Uh, if you want to be notified of future videos, make sure to subscribe and enable notifications with that bell icon. And if you liked the video, or if you didn't like it, uh, leave a like or a dislike. Uh, apparently it helped with exposure. And if you've watched this far, thanks for watching.